I, first of all, I, I, uh, this book, the, the book version of the stage show that you're um, uh, you're about to do in Toronto is is really really funny. I mean, it's candid, but it's funny. It's it's genuinely entertaining, and people have been um, telling me that you're very funny. People who've seen That's your shows in, in the past, do you think of yourself as funny? Um, yeah. You've always I mean, been. Have you always you know, been. The, the I think I. I say if my life wasn't funny, it would just be true, <laughs> and that's unacceptable. So humor, uh, I suppose you could call it a defense mechanism, but it's one of the better, w more enjoyable defense mechanisms that I know of. So and you put if you put something into wor words, it's less dangerous for you. And and you're self-deprecating. I mean, well, that's where the humor comes from. Are, are you, were you always that way? Were you self-deprecating when you were a 19-year-old playing Princess Leia? I was Leia? extremely insecure. I, you know, have always been very insecure about my appearance. Um, you know, I wasn't as smart as older people that I was with and they were going to find out and I didn't graduate high school and I didn't know what the big word meant. So I compensated and tried to by being by by uh, well make, make fun making of fun of myself. Yes, I suppose you could say, and then protecting myself by educating myself so you couldn't pull the wool right out, out from under me. I don't have any wool underneath me, but <laughs> anyway, whatever that saying is. Right, right, right. You've got an interesting relationship with this microphone here. I'm going to make sure that, there you go. Okay. You're supposed to speaking, you're speaking on the side of it there. Larry, now you're good. All right, good. All right, was it? Make sure it's good for you. Was there. It? It's good for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, these these Toronto shows, Carrie, are, are these are the first you've done since your your father, Eddie Fisher, passed away last September. He was uh, the, the famous 1950s crooner and the man who also famously left your mother for Elizabeth Taylor when you were two years old. Does his death change how you approach performing wishful drinking on stage? No, I mean, it, it, but it changes my life. So to that extent, the show is part of my life. Um, I, you know, I guess we sort of had to go through it and see if I had any parts in it that were, you know, referred to him as in the present tense. And he's joined that great past tense in the sky. So, um, but no, it doesn't, it doesn't really change anything. It was, it was fun when he was alive and he would come to the show. And um, he and I, he was in a wheelchair in the end. And we used to sing together, and the song we always sang together was If I Loved You. Hmm. And so he came on stage uh, one time in the last year. We both sang that song together, If I Loved You, and then everyone got, you know, gave a standing ovation, and my father stood up from <laughs> the wheelchair as though he'd been healed by show business, <laughs> which is what I... So I don't get that anymore now that he's passed away. My dad was a lot of fun. You didn't always have uh, an affirmative relationship with him in terms of the way you think of it. I mean, there's a there's a pal palpable sense of anger uh, when you write about Eddie Fisher in this more. film. In I, this book, uh, rather. I was really hurt. Anger. Yeah, I, would, I was able to make it look angry, but it's, you know, it's hurt if you don't, you're a kid and... You're told your father's coming to see you and that he doesn't come. You know, I didn't see a lot of my father, so yeah, it hurt. And I had to probably, you know, pretend that I didn't care and it didn't hurt. How much is wishful drinking about working through your feelings about him and other people in your life? Well, I worked through my feelings about him or whatever the hell <laughs> um, in therapy. I mean, this is an entertainment. I don't think uh, it would be like opening all my chakras on stage and working through everything. I, I have worked through most things. Right. But this, hey. This is a show. It's not cathartic? It's an entertainment. Um, it's cathartic in one sense. It makes you feel invincible. I mean, fearless, sort of. Like if you can go out and say, okay, any questions? Ask me anything. I'll tell you anything. I'll tell you anything. Uh, come up here, you know, just throw, give me all you got. Give me your best shot. And I do, you know, the audience and I interact yeah. and I bring people on stage and and that's exciting. 
I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it was, um, you know, cathartic, but it's in, uh, in, invigorating. You feel invincible. At those times, on I stage. can, yes. But you always have to be also on guard because, you know, it's not always there. Right. It's not always there. The, a comeback, you know. Oh, someone, I see. Right, 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 right. Somebody say something. Somebody you, say something. And you right. can't. Elizabeth Taylor also passed away not too too yeah. long ago. How did that affect you? She obviously had an impact on your life. Well, yeah, no, she was great. And actually, when my father died, um, I called her and told her, and she cried, which was sweet. And uh, also, when she passed away, she left my mother. A suite of jewels. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Hmm. She, a suite, which I didn't know what that was. Yeah, what is a, a suite of jewels? hotel room filled with... <laughs> no, uh, it's uh, earrings, a pin, and a ring. Of, and they're in rubies. I didn't see it yet. Um, you know, they hadn't sent it round. But um, I'm, I'm close with uh, her daughter, Liza Todd. And, and my father adopted Liza Todd. So her legal name was Liza Todd Fisher. My brother's name's Todd Fisher. How did your mother react to the gift from Elizabeth Taylor? Well, of course, she was like incredibly touched. I yeah. mean, they become, you know, they were friends to begin with, ish, show right. business right. friends, and you know, the leaving of the <laughs> put a kind of a damper on their relationship for, for a little yeah. while. It was yeah. Yeah. Uh, this um, okay. So let, let's get into a bit of what you're you're known for. I mean, and what has perhaps followed you around for your whole life. I played that Star Wars clip off the top because it's both the beginning of your career and the end of your book. What what is it like when you hear that speech back today? Camp, <laughs> camp Star Wars. Um, you know, I think it's it's. You know, it's part of my life. I don't even know what I would say. I had a very good time making those movies, especially the second two, because it's a very rare experience to know that you're making a hit movie right. when you're making it. I mean, you know, the it's first a, one you didn't know necessarily. No one knew, and I just thought, well, I'll like it. But you know, the script was fantastic, but you, there wasn't a lot of uh, sci-fi stuff. In, you know, in the media then, and so who knew it was going to do that well? Right. Who knew that there would be figurines and and now perfume? Per, uh, there was Princess, Princess Leia, Leia perfume. perfume with stamp. Uh, <laughs> I now, just, now there's Princess Leia perfume. Yes, no, they're right. getting more and more things over time. <laughs> right, right. There's a cookie jar that's new, <laughs> and I have these things, and some of them look like me, and some of them really <laughs> don't. don't. Yeah, and some are the in the white dress with the bun uh, hairdo, yeah, and some are in the bikini sort of yeah. uh, uh, sci-fi outfit. The right? bikini thing had a very big impact, and <laughs> I, had, <laughs> I had gone into this um, uh, uh, rock store, and the guy behind the counter went, "Oh my God, you're Carrie Fisher. You were." In, I thought about you every day from when I was 12 to when I was 22, and I said every day, and he said, well four times a day. Right. So like, what do you really say to that though? Well, you say that's impressive. Four and times a day. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I don't really know. <laughs> that's a lot of energy. Is that yeah. impressive? <laughs> I wonder yeah. what a, the most would be. Uh, well, they, but that's probably not untrue, right? There's probably a lot of. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't find that people that work in rock stores lie. <laughs> but th this, the the wishful drinking marquee and the cover of your book has Princess Leia. Well, you as Princess Leia, hiding your face after downing what looks like more. Than a few martinis and pills and that image certainly smashes the sweet innocent icon you've been most known for do you feel like princess leia is someone you've been fighting for no, 30 years i mean and i don't think princess leia was sweet you don't no she she was uh she was tough i would have been happier with tougher but you know i had to take gun lessons so that my face didn't squinch up because right. it was so loud because I was supposed to look like all I did growing up was shoot, uh, right. yeah, shoot guns and, and shotguns. They actually sent me to the same person that trained uh, Robert De Niro for Taxi Driver to take gun lessons. 
So there you go. That's something like if all else fails, I can <laughs> you, go in you know how to shoot. People. Yes, yeah. you, you were very young when you were cast in the original Star Wars movie. Did it bother you when you and your likeness as Princess Leia became such a huge commodity that was essentially owned by George Lucas? I mean, did you make much money when your image? No was being money. Sold out? That Nothing. that bothered us, I think, a little bit. No, in those days there was no such thing as um, you know merchandising. So. We didn't sign a con. We we signed away our likeness. So the face you're looking at right now belongs to George Lucas. I I, I own my shoulders, but uh, the rest is his. That's really true. True, true. We have no. We we got. We were paid scale. We had to stay in our own lodging. I mean, it was a really. It for the time, it was a very low budget film. You still make appearances at the odd Star Wars convention. You refer to these in the in the book as celebrity lap dancing. Yes. Um, but you're comfortable with that. I have not said that I'm comfortable with anything <laughs> just yet. Right, right. <laughs> but you attend, do you still attend I, these things? Yeah, no, I, I, you know, yes, I do. So I, I do go celebrity lap dancing. <laughs> well, I, I do it uh, to the conventions and I... Um, it's hilarious. Why do you do it? Because they give me money. Oh. It's, a, it's, a, it's a good deal. And you I get like paid the, to go and... Yeah, and I really actually enjoy them. There are all these people in costumes, and it's just like <laughs> Halloween in a big, giant hangar. But, you know, and the fans for Star... It's insane. They dress little babies up as, you know, Princess Leia's and... Not Yoda so much, but you know that it it's it's a phenomenon that's very difficult to sort of pin down. Carrie, uh, uh, in a lot of your book, and I mean you do this in in a fun, uh, in a in an entertaining way, but it's quite moving too. You talk about your your experiences with drugs, with alcohol, um, with addiction. It's an, you moved to New York City in the late seventies. Your your drug use seemed to ex escalate with your celebrity. On paper, you seem like the ideal person to handle the pressures of of fame. You you were comp you were you were accustomed to the spotlight from the beginning, right? Uh, so why didn't celebrity life suit you? What why was it's not that? I mean, I just you know my father. It's you know there's an element of it that's in my family that I had come from a long line of short alcoholics. So, um, and I couldn't say that uh, it necessarily ha had to do with fame. One of the things, I did not want to be an actress. So c I grew up watching both my parents' careers, more my mother's than my dad's, watching the, them slowly, you know, be not wanted anymore. Yeah. And so I knew that that's what... I have a line that I, I made up all by myself, which is celebrity is just obscurity biding its time. And but that's the way it all goes. I mean, eventually you're going to be the really old, palsied person that they're honoring mm. at the local, you know, MGM. If you're lucky. But, you know, it just age... So I knew that it was this finite thing. So I never really enjoyed it as much as maybe somebody else who didn't know what was in store would. Right. Why did you go into it? I mean, was it always obvious that you had to go into show business? I, my mother put me in her nightclub act. It was our way of having right. a family outing. Right. When I was 13, we came here. So I, it, it was the way of keeping the family together. So I did nightclub work from when I was 13, and then at 15 I was a chorus girl, like most people. And then <laughs> right. I did my first movie, like as a goof. A friend of mine was working on shampoo, and he brought me on stage, the sound stage, and Warren Beatty hired me. And the second movie was Star Wars. Yes. And that's it. And From all there, the time, that time, I'm 17, 18. Yeah. You're not making decisions that you that will, you know, ripple effect out through your life at that age. I wasn't. It just seemed like, oh, God, you know, who of us, well, some probably, but attention is very intoxicating, mm. getting positive attention. And some people like negative attention. Uh, so I've been used to getting. No, I, I, I was. 
I call fame shine, the shine. The shine. So, so I lived on borrowed shine growing up. My, the, my parents had the shine. Then Princess Leia had the shine, not me. She's famous. Then um, Mrs. Paul Simon, that's his sh more borrowed shine. So it's, it's its own kind of phenomenon, you know? It's a very, uh, it's a very unusual business to get into but I certainly never sat down and thought okay right I'm going to what I'm going to do but is But this this show this book and this this show feels like you have the shine Now I may yeah it's more it's me it is me finally Um but it's me talking about myself behind my back but it is <laughs> finally you know being in a way, accepting yourself and, you know, make, making fun of it because taking it seriously would really have been a bit... Then I really would have not survived the drug addiction. Mm. So I never really took a lot of it seriously. So, yeah, so I have some shine now. <laughs> I think you got a lot of shine. you got really... I mean, it's a, it's a very, very... Um, uh, the notices on the show are so excitable, and, and uh, it, it, the book is so entertaining, and it, uh, the run is going to be uh, fantastic. I don't doubt that. I'm kind of upset because I've got a minute left with you here, and look at look at what I had. I had like uh, you know five pages of thoughts that I wanted to like. Yeah, I wanted sure. to ask you about yeah the way you approach mental illness. I wanted to ask you about Paul Simon. I wanted to ask you about um, bipolar disorder, uh, 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 but. Um, we got we got no time, time got for no time. it. I just saw Paul Simon play at Glastonbury. Oh, how was that? It was awesome. Do yeah. you have to go right away? No. So do your people have to? Do you know? No, Does she I have don't. To go? Is it ten yet? Because that's when this. That's your call. Oh, my. It's my I won't call? do this to you on the air, but we can cut. We get. We have to take a minute of break for news. Okay. Can you? Will you come back? Yes, I will. All right. Then we'll have more with Carrie Fisher. <laughs> Thank you for sticking around, Carrie Fisher. Her show is called Wishful Drinking. Uh, it runs in Toronto starting tomorrow night till August twenty first. More with Carrie Fisher when we return on Q. Stick around. Carrie Fisher, actress, writer, um, screenplay uh, person, performer, stage performer, balloonist. Balloonist? Are you a balloonist, or are you making that up? Making it up. <laughs> Thank, you, Carrie. To vary Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Balloonist uh, uh, Carrie Fisher is with me uh, in Studio Q and has very kindly agreed to stay over the break. Thank you so much for staying. My pleasure. Before we, um, although you spent the the five minutes, I thought we would get to chat about our lives. You liar! You walked out. <laughs> you were it tweeting. Was devastating. You, were, you were busy. It was responding. devastating. <laughs> I walked out for thirty seconds. <laughs> it was. I devastating. stormed out. Actually, exactly. <laughs> uh, before we took the break, you 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 mentioned that you had seen your ex husband Paul Simon at Glastonbury last week. Yes, this is one of the biggest festivals in the world, music festivals. What were you doing there? Trying to get through the mud. <laughs> Did you go to see him? <laughs> No, no, I mean, you know, I, my daughter really wanted to go, so it was like for her birthday. Her birthday is actually in six days, so um, because I was going to be here for her birthday, that was her birthday present, so it was just kind of a weird, you know, cross paths. We didn't, I didn't, you know, we just saw him on stage. He actually, he sang uh, the song he wrote about us that was Hearts and Bones, which is a beautiful song. He knew you were there. He did. Did you say hi? There was, you know, like 70... Th no. I mean, what do you mean there's 70... Th you're, <laughs> but I was you're in Carrie Fisher. I was you? in the audience. I don't... There was not, like, access to the backstage. And, you know... We, anyway. Right. But are, you're on good terms, though. Yeah. No, we're not on bad terms. We just, you know, we've you know, moved out. on in our right. lives. Right. Yeah. But that's nice that you would go see him perform. I, I, I'm a huge fan of his. I think he's brilliant. How did... How did you two first meet? Um, we went to um, an award ceremony, and he was getting the award for uh, Annie Hall. He was picking it up for Woody Allen, and I was with the producer of Star Wars picking up the award for that. So then we all went uh, to dinner. It's LA, L.A. Film Critics or something. We all went to dinner afterwards, and Paul and I got in a huge fight. And it was, you know, 
uphill from there. <laughs> <laughs> what, what what made you fall in love with him? Well, he's he's funny. He's brilliantly smart. He's you know we're close in size. <laughs> um, no, I just uh, we it, you know it's sort of like um, speaking a weird dialect when you he has a way of talking that that I. It, I I speak that, so um, he was part of my tribe. Let's say nice, yeah. So it was, it was, and it was. I was younger then. <laughs> Diminutive, funny. He you is funny. He's lot of really funny when he drinks, which is rare. But I remember one time we were at a party and he was drinking some red wine and he poured it on a dog's back. Now you got to marry someone that's going to do that. <laughs> you, you, there's, you reference Paul Simon in some of his lyrics in various parts of this book and this show. Uh, on the album "The Rhythm of the Saints," um, Paul Simon wrote a song called "She Moves On," mm -hmm. which was about you. Uh, in the song, he sings, "She's like a top; she cannot stop, and I'm afraid I'll be taken, abandoned, and forsaken in her cold coffee eyes." What's it like to become the subject of one of his songs? Fantastic. Negative or positive, it, uh, you know, he, he speaks so visually uh, and he looks at everything from a, a, such an interesting slant uh, that really none of it could be negative. It's just all. We had a hilarious argument once on whether it was better to be a man or a woman. <laughs> it was like, well, women get those seven extra years. Yeah, to have your, you know, tits down to your waist. And <laughs> he was right. he was just, verb his verbal acuity was off the charts. And, you know, I could follow that. Did I you, could try did, my best. I learned, I apprenticed myself to him. Did you feel exposed in some way, having him write about you? No. I'm, I grew up exposed. <laughs> <laughs> Southern exposure. <laughs> right. You've described your, your, yourself as being more than Paul Simon could handle. Well, or, I'm, I am a lot. And he, his thing is, he, she's like a top. She cannot stop. She used to talk so. Um, she said, maybe these emotions are as near to love as love would ever be. And I agree. You know, he just... We we couldn't. We were two flowers, no garden. Right, yeah, right. Why were you Why are you so difficult to handle? Uh, um, well, I think in this case, or you know, I I I I'm I was who he wanted, but not what. On the what score, I'm not very cooperative. Now, since then, <laughs> I've improved, and you know, so I'm. Hoping you'll send in any, you know, photos and re dating requests, because I'm ho hoping to uh, you're get married up here in Canada. But I'm not. Are you? Are you on the market? Are you? 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 Uh, just as for for now, yes. Just for now. Yes, <laughs> for my stay here. Right. right. And uh, so I, um, <laughs> I, I'm not a very uh, obedient, mm. cooperative. Right. Maybe. Uh, so what, what if somebody that you hook up with here d develops strong feelings for you, and then, then what happens? We could get married and live and live here, and I okay. would get sick of okay. me talking so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. That's maybe, it. Maybe you know. not. I've mellowed out, so I'm not as big of a trial. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's true. I don't have the energy to. I was also, when I was with Paul, I was 21 years old. That's when we started, to, you know, and then it went on, off and on. A lot of off and on, so that's a lot of drama. Yeah, for like twelve years. Yeah, it's quite. It uh, even knowing that you're a Princess Leia at nineteen, it's that's quite it's a lot. It's just to a lot. To the whole yeah. thing, and he's yeah. not that kind of a person, really. He's more introverted. He's not a Princess Leia type. Well, in a way, <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what time of the day you're talking about. But um, you know, it, it all reduced anyone I've ever gone out with to. It's just saying dumb Star Wars thing. <laughs> I actually read a quote that Paul had said it on 60 Minutes, which was, the force is with her. He <laughs> said that. This is like a brilliant guy who said that. And there was another one. Uh, <laughs> anyway, just... Right, right. <laughs> no, Senator Dodd. I went out with Senator yes, Dodd. Now, did. I yeah. never told anyone that. That's no, private, right? He talks right? about that. Now, yeah. he's running around. 
around saying... Well, he's saying, proud that he got to saying, date Carrie Fisher. Saying at least twice, <laughs> it's a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, when asked about dating me. He's <laughs> right. a senator. <laughs> right. You well, don't talk, you know, droid talk when you're a certain... <laughs> Past a certain age. I like it. So I like the fact that you're not taking umbrage at the fact that he talks about dating you. It's that he references Star Wars. It's so goofy. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. I, you it's, know. No, it's I, cool that he can, you're a notch on his, uh, you know, proverbial belt. But well, it, it I just don't, don't see, I didn't hear a lot of other notches. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd be interested if you heard of any. I'd like to hear who I'm, who's my group. You, you, you know, as, as much as wishful drinking is about. Uh, your your career. It's about drug and alcohol abuse. It it is really about mental illness. You make it clear that some of your memories have been lost because of your decision to undergo electroconvulsive treatment (ECT), mm-hmm. which is commonly electroshock therapy. I have two electric bills to pay. <laughs> These are the gags I make up about this. But tell me about taking what some would see as a dramatic approach to deal with your depression. You get to a certain point, and nothing else is working. And I started out in the beginning of like, are you joking? I'm not going to go and, you know, nurse ratchet myself to death. The media has, Reference to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's yeah, Nest, which the is what some of us think really, of. The media has really, you know, turned it into how, how uh, people in mental hospitals control the patients. But that's what they make it look like it is. Also, not for a really long time now, they have a medication. There's no convulsion. They put you out. You know, so there's no trauma with it. But you do have to, you know, you exhaust other things. But I think it's it it's was very, very helpful. You, you explore a number of psychiatric labels that you've had to contend with through the years, everything from manic depressive, bipolar to post-traumatic. Before you were diagnosed you're some just some moody chick well no it, it was your drug and alcohol abuse that people yeah. were focusing on was that masking the mental illness do you think uh, not well enough <laughs> <laughs> uh you know you cannot diagnose someone uh whether they're bipolar or, or not if they're using because if you use the way i did and the way someone's really into it uses it looks like bipolar I mean, you know, you, you're you're imitating, you know, because it's all drama up and down, and like like somebody high. So when you get the only way to diagnose someone is, is when they get sober. And I got I came into this rehab with a bunch of people. We all went to meetings together, hung out for that year. Everybody else calmed down, right. and you know, and I was still spinning around in chairs and. So I had to go turn myself back into the bipolar police and eventually did do that. When you make mental illness part of a stage show that you perform each night, um, it, it's become, uh, and rightly so, uh, this, 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 this pattern where people congratulate you for, for coming out with this and being public about it. You've won, you've won awards for this, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do, do, when did you, though, in seriousness, when was it okay for you to it's be not, public about this? I don't this? know that it, you know, it came out. I didn't put it out there. So I was, when I was in a mental hospital, she said casually, uh, something came out in one of the, you know, rags saying, uh, under the heading, my favorite, Carrie Fisher's tragic life. And then just, you know, how nuts I was and I was in a nut house. And, uh, so it's, well, it's gotta be, I better, if I, I don't want you to be able to say it. I'm going to own it. I'm not, right. not going to let you out me as it were. If I can own it, accept it, not be ashamed of it. And that this is the way to do it, because otherwise people have power over you. If you're ashamed of this, anything, uh, then they can, you know. You say in the book, you're only as sick as your secrets. Right. Totally. Tell me what that means. Uh, anything you're scared that other people are going to find out puts you at a tremendous disadvantage, because they will find out, you know. And it and it makes you, it leaves you sort of tense and scared, you know, that my, if, what if somebody finds out, you know, all those things that usually the, the things that, that make us ashamed are, you know, sexual in nature or 
drug and alcohol or, you know, just things, weaknesses. Relationships with former senators. That I'm very ashamed of. So I just, you know, he started putting that out there. Um, you know, no, that wouldn't be, I don't know why that, that just, it seems funny to me. It just seems, in, you know, there's a part of it that's insane. I, it, it you have an interesting dating history. It doesn't occur You got to senators, me Paul Simon, Dan Aykroyd. You got to, you know, you, there's. Well, I was engaged to Danny, which is my big connection to uh, Canada. Canada. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, actually got blood tests, the whole shot, and uh, you got blood tests. Yeah, we were like really engaged, <laughs> not just like partly. Um, now he's great. He John how John Belushi set us up, and here is a John Belushi blind date. <laughs> Carrie, come down here, the house in the village. Yay! I come down. Danny's there. John passes out. Well, That's the blind date, right? He, he enabled the date, the date yeah. in that case. Uh, the the t- I know I got to let you go, and you've been very gracious to stay as long as you have. The title, "Wishful Drinking," it does suggest you've you've always been hoping for something. What do you hope for now? Uh, well, being a you know, being a good mother, um, being able to you know keep my Get my get the job done. Keep my behavior somewhat in check, predictable. You know, be able someone that shows up, you can rely on. So I don't even remember now what the question was. <laughs> Your hopes. <laughs> my hopes. Well, you know, I've uh, I want to travel. My biggest fan. Okay, I'm going to do a fantasy that's uh, not like a hope. Well, one of them is sure. you know dating someone from Canada. But the other one is going to the ice festival in, uh, not Shanghai, in uh, Harbin, China. They literally, they build. This is where, of course, me and the Canadian guy would go on our honeymoon. Right. (laughs) They build entire (laughs) cities of ice and then light them with neon. So. You know, this Canadian guy thing, this can be facilitated. Okay. Yeah. Then you you do that. I, I, first of all, I'm somewhat offended that you don't consider me a candidate. But but you're second, you're too young for me, aren't you? How well, old are you? I'm, I'm early forties. It's not so I'm, bad. I'm older. Yeah, but that's okay, right? And we have that whole Mrs. Robinson thing. We, <laughs> I, you're not that much older. I'd say what I'm like a decade older. Yeah, right? that's not so bad. All right. Well, when do we go out? Well, you got to, you got shows every night. You know, see, there's an excuse. So you're trying to get out of it, so, and that's what I think that you know. No, uh, th- uh, but but really, my boy Bill. We can, but uh, but, re- but, but but listen to me. But really, but but there will be. I uh, after this interview, you you are going to get a lot of suitors now. You know that. You're comfortable with that. That's good. Yeah, I think that's the best way to go. I've Trips I've tried to China. every other way of dating, and now I just think. You know, put it out there in an interview. Put it, wh- 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 <laughs> whore yourself on the radio, Carrie Fisher. It's been. I don't a, mean that romantically. It's been a really. Uh, 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 Find the word quickly. Well, Make it I was going to say it's going to be. It's a pleasure, but I always say that. So I was thinking. Of, I was thinking of something more innovative. Um, it's been uh, energizing, getting, invigorating, invigorating, getting to have you here and and speaking to you. And I look forward to your show. Well, I look forward to you coming, and I'm, I'll drag you on stage for the Star Wars mm. portion. <laughs> I'll be hiding. I'll be hiding like Carrie I Fisher at Glastonbury. You. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for this. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed myself very much. That's actress and author Carrie Fisher. Her one-woman show, uh, also the name of her book, is called Wishful Drinking. And Carrie Fisher has been with me here live in Studio Q.
you were very young when you were cast in the original Star Wars movie. Did it bother you when you and your likeness as Princess Leia became such a huge commodity that was essentially owned by George Lucas? I mean, did you make much money when you were no money? Sort of, that nothing. that bothered us, I think, a little bit. No, in those days there was no such thing as um, you know merchandising, so we didn't sign a con. We we signed away our likeness, so the face you're looking at right now belongs to George Lucas. I I, I own my shoulders, but uh, the rest is his. That's really true. True, true. We have no. We we got. We were paid scale. We had to stay in our own lodging. I mean, it was a really. It for the time, it was a very low budget film. You still make appearances at the odd Star Wars convention. You refer to these in the in the book as celebrity lap dancing. Yes. Um, but you're comfortable with that. I have not said that I'm comfortable with anything <laughs> just yet. Right. <laughs> we'll but you attend, do you still attend I, these things? Yeah, no, I, I, you know, yes, I do. So I, I do go celebrity lap dancing. <laughs> I do it uh, to the conventions, and I, um, it's hilarious. Why do you do it? Because they give me money. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good deal. And you I get like paid the, to go and... Yeah, and I really actually enjoy them. There are all these people in costumes, and it's just like <laughs> Halloween in a big, giant hangar. But, you know, and the fans for Star... It's insane. They dress little babies up as, you know, Princess Leia's and not Yoda so much. But, you know, they, it, it's, it's a phenomenon that's very difficult to sort of pin down. Carrie, uh, uh, in a lot of your book, and I mean, you do this in, in a fun, uh, in, a, in an entertaining way, but it's quite moving, too. You talk about your, your experiences with drugs, with alcohol, um, with addiction. It's an, you moved to New York City in the late 70s. Your, your drug use seemed to ex escalate with your celebrity. On paper... You seem like the ideal person to handle the pressures of, of fame. You, you, were comp well, you were accustomed to the spotlight from the beginning, right? Uh, so why didn't celebrity life suit you? What, why was... It's not that. I mean, I just, you know, my father, it's, you know, there's an element of it that's in my family that I come from a long line of short alcoholics. So, um, and I couldn't say that uh, it necessarily ha had to do with fame. One of the things, I did not want to be an actress. So c I grew up watching both my parents' careers, more my mother's than my dad's, watching the, them slowly, you know, be not wanted anymore. Yeah. And so I knew that that's what, I have a line that I, I made up all by myself, which is celebrity is just obscurity biding its time. And but that's the way it all goes. I mean, eventually you're going to be the really old, palsied person that they're honoring mm. at the local, you know, MGM, if you're lucky. But, you know, it just age. So I knew that it was this finite thing. So I never really enjoyed it. As much as maybe somebody else who didn't know what was in store would. Right. 